Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the organizer very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, very interesting uh, workshop. And um, so, I I'm going to discuss uh, a little bit of uh, a set of ideas on which I've been working with many people, uh, including uh, Emanuele Massa, which is uh, here in the audience, and um, uh, which have to do with trying to understand what uh, learning in, in general, okay? So here is uh, an outline, if it works, let's see. Does not work, oh, okay. Okay, first of all, uh, <coughs> oh, no, it doesn't work, uh, okay. Um, sorry. Uh, I think uh, what I should do is to um, okay let's see if this works um, okay so this is uh, an overview uh, first of all uh, the kind of things uh, I'm going to uh, present are rather uh, unconventional perspective on learning in this, uh, in this audience. And it's essentially, uh, most of what I'm going to say is, is essentially reviewed in this paper, uh, which we wrote with uh, uh, Yasser Rudi. And um, so the main point uh, is that, uh, I'll try to convince you that uh, there is a quantitative measure of what making sense means, uh, which we call uh, relevance. And, um, and then uh, uh, this allows you to look at uh, maximal, maximally relevant data and uh, maximally relevant uh, res representation. And, uh, and one finds that these are, there is a link uh, with statistical criticality uh, between, say, relevance and statistical criticality. So here relevance means uh, uh, essentially uh, what this uh, workshop should uh, be dealing with, with the structuring data, okay? And uh, I'll first discuss uh, data, and then I'll discuss the properties of uh, uh, representation. I don't know how much time we'll have to go all through all these points, but um, it's a perspective that, uh, I mean, what I'll try to convince you is that uh, it allows you to uh, address a number of uh, uh, conceptual issues uh, that um, at least I find uh, uh, interesting because they clarify uh, a number of loosely defined uh, uh, concepts uh, uh, in learning, okay? But let me uh, try to be more uh, precise, uh, precise. Okay, so um, there is uh, one clear way of uh, being structureless, which is maximum entropy. Uh, so this is a statement that essentially um, uh, there is nothing to be learned from data that is completely random and uh, maximum entropy. And, um, and essentially there are infinite ways uh, of uh, uh, being uh, meaningful or, 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 or making sense. And uh, the key point is that uh, um, uh, learning, uh, in my perspective, is exactly about understanding in which way a data set makes sense. And um, so um, this means that essentially um, uh, what I have in mind is uh, that uh, um, uh, what we want to learn is essentially uh, uh, how the data that you see makes sense for the system that you are studying, okay? So it's, a, it's an intrinsic notion, okay? And, um, uh, and learning is essentially finding out what is this uh, um, way in which the data that you are studying uh, makes sense, okay? Okay, so um, the other thing is that uh, learning uh, um, is, uh, I mean, um, 
usually statistical learning focuses on the asymptotic regime where essentially you know, the dimension of the problem uh, is finite and you look at an infinite uh, number of data points. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a rather unnatural uh, uh, domain regime if you really think about uh, understanding learning, uh, biological learning. Biological learning most likely, of course, in what I call the undersampling regime, so where the data is barely sufficient to, to, um, to make, uh, to, um, to draw conclusion or to make a model, essentially, no? And, um, and essentially there are these two uh, uh, mirror problems, so that on one hand, uh, you have uh, data that should have some uh, structure, and on the other hand, uh, uh, you have the problem of forming an internal representation <laughs> that mirrors this, uh, uh, this structure. So, so the problem of defining uh, what does it mean for a data to make sense and what does it mean for an internal representation or probability distribution to make sense or to be meaningful uh, are essentially the same problem. Okay, so um, of course, uh, if you know uh, um, what is the sense, I mean, um, uh, what is the sense uh, uh, in which data makes sense, huh? so if you know the model from which the data is drawn, you can quantify how much data makes sense in the sense that you can, you can measure in bits uh, the, the number of bits that you learn. And, and this is essentially uh, what you do in, uh, um, in statistics. So you have some data that you think uh, comes from uh, uh, a certain model that depends on some parameters. You have a prior distribution of the parameters. Uh, and then you compute your posterior. And out of this, you can compute the mutual information between your data and uh, um, and the parameters, and essentially what you find is that uh, uh, the amount of bits that you learn is given by this formula, this uh, M is the number of parameters, so this is uh, essentially uh, the BIC term, and then uh, there are sub-leading terms which are related to uh, the Fisher information and the prior, this tells you how much the data is surprising given, given your, uh, your prior. But, but essentially, this is the wrong problem because essentially, uh, you know that uh, in, this, uh, in this problem, uh, all the information is contained in the sufficient statistics and you decide a priori what the sufficient statistics are. So um, you just measure how much you learn on the parameters, not how much you learn on what is the structure of the data. Okay, and then the other thing is that you learn these many bits anyhow. I mean, uh, whatever the model is uh, and whatever the data is, you always learn uh, this, uh, uh, this, 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 this many bits, okay, to leading order, okay. So uh, there is no guarantee that this is, these are really meaningful bits or these are the right bits in some sense, okay. The other thing which is worth mentioning is that uh, the amount of uh, information that you learn is always uh, much, much less than the information content of the data set uh, because it's essentially growing uh, as logarithm of n, uh, whereas the amount of bits that you need to describe the data set is growing as n. Okay, so uh, essentially this is the uh, wrong problem. Yeah, please. Can you precise a bit more what you mean by then you learn that many bits anyhow? I mean, uh, because this term here does not depend on the model, and does not, depends only on how many data points you have and how many parameters you have. And um, I mean, the shape of the model, the structure of the model only enters in the subleading terms. Okay, so, um, and essentially it does not, uh, you don't, 
so if you think about also how good is your fit only enters uh, into this G hat here. Uh, so, the, the, so even if the noise is completely random, uh, you learn this many bits. And what is G hat? G hat is the maximum likelihood estimates. I mean, this is a, this is a subtle point calculation. You can compute uh, this mutual information by subtle point calculation when n is going is large, okay. essentially. Okay. So Any other questions? What happens huh? uh, if the determinant j equal to zero? The, the oh, Fisher yes, information? Yes. yes. If we have the, uh, the, the Fisher information is a susceptibility, right? So, um, um, usually... Um, but um, marginally a neural network. Sorry? Marginally a neural network sometimes the uh -huh. uh, singular. Yes, okay. So, so um, I'm not discussing uh, neural net. Indeed, essentially. But at, at the moment, you assume that this is regular. Yes, okay. yes, yes. I mean, for the moment, I'm just saying uh, uh, that, oh, sorry. Um, I'm just saying that, uh, um, oh, well, okay. I don't know how can I go back, so. I'm just saying, uh, Focusing on uh, statistical inference, if you want, the basic setup of statistical inference, okay? Where you think you know the model, what the model is, and, and you just, uh, okay. Okay, you can think of doing uh, Bayesian model selection, but essentially uh, uh, you soon realize that this is uh, really um, hopeless in the sense that uh, even for a very low dimensional system, uh, the number of models uh, is, uh, astronomical, and even for one of these models, uh, computing uh, this uh, posterior can be, can be very hard, okay? So this is not uh, 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 a good uh, uh, way of doing things, okay? So, um, so the idea is that essentially you can think of uh, defining uh, um, or estimating how much uh, information does a data set uh, contains, uh, how much useful information does a data, uh, data set contains uh, by um, um, uh, by just uh, uh, using uh, um, basic information theory idea. So imagine that you have a data set and, uh, and you think uh, these data are IID uh, drawn from a certain model. Okay, so the probability of the data set is written like this. Uh, this is what you have in mind when you think uh, of this uh, observation uh, coming from uh, independent observation of, uh, 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 or independent experiments, as well in, done in the same way, in the same uh, conditions. And then uh, you can compute how much, how many bits you would need to compress, to store this data on your uh, data set. And essentially an estimate is given by, uh, say, the empirical entropy, so or the entropy of the empirical distribution, where this Ks is the number of times that you observe uh, one particular outcome in this, uh, uh, in this data set, okay? Now this is uh, uh, the total number of, the total amount of uh, uh, bits that you need to represent uh, this, uh, this data, but not all these bits are useful. And, um, and you can split these bits into a part which is uh, useful, and a, or, or which is an upper bound, say, or, or a lower bound to, those, uh, to the part which is useful, and the rest, okay? And the way you do this uh, is by observing that uh, say uh, uh, you can split this entropy into a part uh, which is the entropy of your outcomes uh, with the same frequency k. And the probability distribution of uh, outcomes which have the same frequency is by definition a maximum entropy distribution because it's flat. And so this is essentially uh, meaningless information and this is uh, uh, what rests, uh, what remains is, uh, is essentially an upper bound on, on how much information uh, you can extract from this uh, data set, okay? 
And this is essentially what we define uh, as uh, uh, relevance, okay? The entropy of the frequency distribution, we, we, we call it relevance, whereas the entropy of, this, uh, of the variable S, uh, or what you measure, is a measure of the resolution because essentially you can change the resolution by redefining what you measure. Once you define what is the variable that you measure or how you classify your data or whatever, then uh, this defines uh, what this other number is, is okay? So this is, uh, um, this is decided by the data, essentially, okay? Okay, so this is uh, uh, our notion of relevance, and by the way, uh, this gives you, uh, uh, there are questions? Uh, okay, so uh, by the way, you, you can uh, combine the two arguments I gave you before to give a rough estimate of what is the maximal number of uh, parameters that you can estimate from, uh, from a data set, uh, which, is, uh, which is given by, by this formula. And, and the idea is that essentially the amount of, inf from any model, the amount of information that you learn on the parameters is essentially given by this formula, and this cannot be larger than uh, the amount of information, uh, the amount of useful, info, the upper bound on the number of useful information, okay? Very good. Eh? N is the number of data points. M is the number of parameters. So M is the model and this, uh, no, this thing is the number of parameters. Uh, Matteo, is M related to the support size of the discretization you do in H hat K? Uh, can you, so the discretization is related to how you define S. Yes. Essentially, yes. And, and is that set S supported on a set with M points or no? Um, not necessarily. So not necessarily. I mean, you, you can define it uh, uh, in any way. I mean, and essentially you can also think uh, that your, uh, the support uh, is not uh, uh, defined a priori. So imagine that uh, you go out and sample, uh, I don't know, species of flowers in an unknown island. Uh, you have a criterion for saying uh, whether two flowers are the same species or not but you don't know how many species there are, okay? So, um, okay, so. Okay, so, uh, so this is the, uh, the main uh, idea. So that essentially you have your data, you compute the frequency, and then uh, you compute the multiplicity, how many times you observe, uh, uh, how many <laughs> objects you observe k times, how many outcomes you observe k times, uh, and then you compute these two numbers, okay? And then you can see, how, as, uh, as you change your definition uh, of uh, what you measure, of your data set, then, then essentially the point uh, in this plot uh, uh, can move. And, and this is the example, for example, of um, uh, data clustering. You can think of data clustering as uh, um, a way of, uh, um, uh, yes, de defining a variable and, and, and the size of the cluster is essentially the frequency. And, um, and then essentially if you, if you look at different uh, clustering algorithms, uh, you have different curves uh, as the number of clusters changes from uh, n uh, uh, to just one, okay? And, uh, and the idea of this plot is that you see that uh, um, there are uh, ways of doing this clustering which are more informative than others, okay? And uh, in particular, uh, say this is, uh, this is a particular example of uh, stocks in New York exchange and um, and essentially this, uh, uh, this method here is based on, uh, uh, say, let's say a more refined uh, model of Gaussian correlation between stocks that takes into account uh, that there is a market mode, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the idea is that the, 
the more you refine your model, the higher you go in this, in this curve. Okay, so uh, the other point uh, which we can uh, realize in this plot is that uh, <coughs> you have a trade-off between these two quantities. So when you compress your data, then uh, uh, your resolution, your relevance also changes. And, uh, and you can think at uh, what happens when you compress by one bit, uh, how many bits you learned, okay? And there are essentially two regions here. So, um, so there is a region where essentially this curve uh, is very steep. Uh, and here, when you compress by one bit, you, you learn a lot of, a lot of bits uh, in about the model. And uh, in this other region, uh, instead, uh, uh, you, lose, you, you, don't, uh, you lose less. And in this region, this is the over, uh, oversampling regime. You are just compressing your, uh, your model. Okay, so <coughs> now, uh, having defined this thing, you can ask a question, what are uh, uh, data, data sets uh, which are maximally informative? Because you can solve this, uh, uh, this simple problem here. And if you solve it, uh, uh, you can find a, a curve that maximizes this, uh, this curve here. And, uh, and what you can find is that uh, at the maximum, uh, the the data points, the, the samples that maximize this curve are all given by power law distribution in frequency. Okay, so they exhibit what is called the statistical criticality. And, uh, and at this maximum, you can define this, uh, 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 this trade-off uh, uh, between resolution and relevance and see that this trade-off is precisely related uh, to the exponent uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, statistical uh, uh, of this power law behavior. In the sense that uh, uh, the, the number of bits that uh, when you compress by one bit uh, in resolution, you gain mu bits in relevance. So there is one part of this, uh, uh, so there is one particular point here, mu, which separates uh, a noisy regime where essentially when you compress by one bit, you get more bits on the model. And a noisy regime, uh, and a noiseless, if you want, uh, uh, lossy compression regime, which is uh, on, the, um, on the other side, okay? And there is a speci specific point when this mu is equal to one, which is essentially uh, the optimal lossless compression point. Okay, data set that essentially realize the optimal lossless compression. And this is essentially what is called, uh, generally called uh, zip flow. Okay, zip flow is a uh, um, statistical uh, uh, behavior that is observed in many uh, domains uh, which have to do with somehow with representations where essentially um, the number of uh, uh, items uh, that occur k times uh, is inversely proportional to k squared. Or if you want the rank, uh, if, you f if you rank uh, uh, objects by frequency, uh, then uh, the rank of the k objects goes as uh, the frequency to the minus one. Okay, so um, now, of course, we check that uh, this uh, thing makes sense uh, in uh, uh, machine learning because you can look at the internal representation of, uh, in this case, uh, um, uh, just a restricted Boltzmann machine and uh, deep belief networks. And you can sample uh, the internal states of these machines and check whether the uh, the, the relevance of each of these machines is maximal, is close to this maximal line for that particular value of the resolution. And more or less, uh, it works uh, reasonably well. And um, you have, uh, you can also do this, uh, look at uh, what happens in, um, in language, and in language, uh, uh, you look at the frequency distribution of, uh, um, 
of different texts. And for example, there is a guy who has studied, uh, uh, there are many people who have studied the Holy Bible. And uh, one guy has studied 100 translation of the Holy Bible and computed these exponents. And, uh, and you can see that generally, um, uh, say, earlier translation, later translation are sort of uh, compressed version of uh, uh, earlier translations. I mean, you can interpret it in this way, OK? OK, so um, we also uh, apply this idea to study some um, to inference and to try to extract uh, uh, meaningful information from, uh, say, uh, sequences uh, from, say, in this case, uh, sequences of proteins. Uh, and the idea here is that, uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a system where there is no true model. And, uh, and also, you are really working in the undersampling regime. So, and uh, we have applied also this to um, data in the brain uh, where uh, uh, you can ask the question of uh, um, what neurons uh, uh, is more informative uh, for a particular uh, correlate, uh, or what neurons is generally more relevant, okay? And um, of course, uh, uh, the way in which neuroscientists do this uh, is to take, uh, is to look at the correlation between the neural activity and the correlate, uh, and then look at what is the mutual information between uh, neural activity and the particular correlate. Uh, this is the case of uh, navigation in, uh, in, in rats. But essentially, uh, you should be able to do this even without having a correlate, uh, even without having any correlate, because the brain does, does that. Uh, the brain is able to figure out uh, that, I mean, uh, this neuron uh, is not particularly informative, whereas this one, they are informative about the position, okay? And so, um, I think uh, this is frozen. Hello? Ah, okay. And, uh, and so, essentially, uh, what we came up with is a way of applying this idea and uh, deriving a particular measure that we call multiscale relevance. And what we find is that uh, uh, when this measure is small, when this multiscale relevance is small, there is uh, neurons that have a small multiscale relevance do not contain any information on spatial correlates, whereas neurons uh, that contain information on, on uh, spatial uh, um, uh, correlates, uh, they, uh, they have high relevance. And essentially, if you take these neurons and try to decode the position, you actually do as well as if you took the neurons which are mostly informative about the position. Okay. Okay, so let me switch now to, uh, uh, I think I have, uh, who is my, uh, yeah. Huh? Okay, so, okay, so let me switch to, um, instead the re representation, so, Look, now, now essentially, uh, I'm going to move uh, from uh, the data to uh, the internal state of a machine that is supposed to represent this data. And essentially, you can uh, rephrase uh, the argument in the same uh, way, in the sense that uh, you can say, well, the relevant variable is the coding cost. How many bits do I need to, to, to represent uh, one state? And uh, you can compute the resolution as the average coding cost. And, um, and then uh, you can uh, think of the relevance as the entropy of the coding cost, OK? And um, where this uh, P of E is the distribution of the coding cost, which is essentially the number of the degeneracy the number of states which have a coding cost e times e to the minus e, which is the probability of that state. And uh, the maximally informative uh, 
uh, representation are those which have this, uh, satisfy this principle of maximum relevance that maximize this uh, uh, object here at a given value of the resolution. Okay, and again, uh, the idea is that uh, you can split uh, the coding cost uh, into two parts. Uh, one part is noise because all these states have the same energy, so they are essentially uh, maximum entropy distributions, whereas this uh, is an upper bound to the uh, signal. And what you get out of this is that uh, uh, the uh, distribution of energy levels uh, uh, the degeneracy should be exponential, which is essentially the analog of having statistical criticality. And if you think about it, this is uh, criticality in the sense of uh, uh, statistical physics, in the sense that uh, it tells you that the entropy is linear with the energy. So that the specific heat uh, uh, is uh, the second derivative, uh, which is the inverse of the second derivative is infinite. Okay, so um, now you, in this picture, uh, this picture takes into account that uh, uh, really learning is very different uh, from uh, statistical physics. Uh, statistical physics uh, is described by maximum entropy distribution, which means that you are looking at a system that retains the least amount of information about its environment. Okay, actually it retains only one number, which is the temperature, okay? And as a result, uh, what you have is essentially the asymptotic equipartition property that tells you uh, that uh, the number of states with a given energy E is essentially uh, proportional to E, okay? It's, so, but, but this occurs just in one point. So if you want, the asymptotic equipartition property tells you that Typical states have a probability which is e to the minus the entropy, which is essentially inversely proportional to the number of typical states, okay? And uh, in a, um, in a uh, learning machine, uh, if you think about this, uh, that they are described by this uh, maximum relevance uh, principle, essentially you have a broad distribution of energy levels in the sense that uh, the, um, this linear behavior uh, between energy and entropy uh, extends over a certain range. And actually this linear behavior, it's easy to understand. So uh, if you want, it's, it's an optimal use of uh, uh, the information resources that you have. So uh, minus log of P is the number of bits that you need to code one state. If you need uh, that many bits, uh, then you would like to have an, a number of uh, uh, states which have that coding cost, uh, which is the exponential of that, because you have that many bits. I don't know if this is clear. So, so if you if you have. Uh, um, if this is minus the log of. P of S, and, uh, which is what I call E. And if this is the entropy, which is the log of uh, the number of states uh, with a given energy E, then, uh, so this is the number of bits that you need to code a particular state. With these bits, uh, you can uh, uh, code uh, at most uh, a number of uh, uh, a number of states uh, which is equal, which is exactly equal to E, okay? And then uh, essentially optimal uh, representation are representation where you have uh, an energy <laughs> range which, which is as close as possible to this limit, okay? So, okay, so even uh, uh, in this case, you can think about a, a trade-off between uh, 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 resolution and relevance. And actually, what is interesting from a statistical mechanics point of view is that you can think of this as a relation between energy and entropy, but the concavity is uh, the other way around. And this is because this is, a, this is the dual problem, okay? It's a very different problem. 
it's a dual problem with the one of statistical mechanics. Uh, and indeed, essentially, in statistical mechanics, uh, uh, criticality only occurs at very special point. Uh, whereas uh, uh, in, uh, in these systems, uh, criticality is a, a typical property. Okay. Okay, so uh, you can uh, sort of establish uh, a relation that tells you that this relevance is a lower bound to how much, how much you can learn about hidden features. I'm not going through this if you want uh, details. Also, you can establish, uh, I mean, a specific uh, example where you, um, uh, you take a... Uh, um, you model a deep belief network as a random energy model, as a sequence of random energy models, you can uh, really, uh, say, understand that criticality is needed uh, in order to transfer, transmit information across layers. And also, I'm not going to too much details. And the other thing that you understand is that actually Gaussian data or Gaussian model actually do not make sense. I mean, if you believe in this picture, because essentially you can compute, uh, you can take uh, like a Gaussian learning machine, like a Gaussian Prestita Bolsa machine, and you can compute the entropy, the, 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 the relevance, the resolution and the relevance. And what you find is that the relevance uh, does not depend on the data at all. So uh, it's just constant. Um, and this tells you that, uh, and indeed this is what you see, I mean, when you see, uh, when you train a Gaussian learning machine on MNIST, uh, essentially it does not do a very good job. And I mean, maybe we didn't do it very well, but it does much better than uh, what we could do on, uh, with uh, RBM. And, um, and the, the idea is that uh, uh, even if you have a Gaussian learning machine, in the end, uh, this can only model Gaussian, can only model one, just one distribution, which is a Gaussian. Whereas, the, say, the structure in the data is related to disentangling a mixture of distributions. Okay. Okay, uh, so uh, in the last... Uh, Five minutes, yeah, five minutes. So I would like to tell you some uh, last thing that uh, we have been uh, thinking about, uh, exploiting this idea. And the idea is essentially uh, to think about uh, learning machines, uh, simple learning machines, uh, that uh, um, where essentially the uh, internal representation is fixed. Okay, so now that we know how to, uh, what, what are the properties, I mean, that, uh, say an internal representation which is maximally informative uh, should have maximal relevance. Then we can think of, uh, okay, yeah. let's fix it uh, and uh, uh, let's just learn uh, how the data is projected to this internal representation. And this is, um, yes, like, uh, uh, I mean, if you contrast this uh, way of learning uh, with the way of learning uh, in Restricted Bolsa Machine, Restricted Bolsa Machine is like you build uh, the representation as long as you learn. Okay, indeed, uh, if you look at the internal representation, what is the distribution of energy levels inside of the hidden, of the hidden layer during learning, uh, it evolves uh, from something which resembles like, a, a, I don't know, a, a spin glass or something like that, or a random system, to something which has uh, like a broad distribution of energy levels. Okay, yeah. so, so and the question is, uh, uh, this is essentially, uh, should be thermodynamically efficient, and you, you can make an argument by which essentially the, the work that you need uh, to uh, uh, train us to learn a data set uh, should be, uh, say, lower bounded by something which is the mutual information between uh, the data and internal representation, plus something which is essentially the DKL uh, between your initial and final internal uh, distributions, okay? 
And so you would like this to be as close as possible for thermodynamic efficiency. But also, you would like to have a, a representation which is sort of flexible, by which I mean maybe you can add a, a, a new hidden variable without scrambling the whole representation that you have learned, okay, which is what happens uh, in Resistive Bolsa machine. So in Resistive Bolsa machine, if you had a new hidden variable, then there is a complete rearrangement of all things. Or, or, or even if you want to compress your representation, look at a different, uh, um, um, a more compressed representation, then uh, uh, what you want to do, be able to do is to change the internal state, uh, the internal distribution, without having to uh, retrain the machine, uh, okay? And uh, also, uh, there are other reasons why you want to do this. Uh, say, for example, uh, uh, you want to have a machine by which uh, you can, uh, if you learn uh, that set X and X prime, then you may want to, uh, in, say, imagine what the relation between X and X prime can be, okay, by just uh, marginalizing over the internal state. Or uh, um, you can, think about other uh, uh, um, properties like imagination that is, uh, say once you define at the outset what your P of S is, uh, it's not evident that all the states will be filled by your data set. So maybe there is some data set which is okay. So essentially, um, this is what we did. I mean, uh, uh, we studied this type of machine and we th thought about uh, uh, a type of machine <laughs> where uh, you have a hierarchy of features, okay, where uh, you start with uh, your data set, uh, and in the beginning you say, well, okay, these are all images, and then uh, you say, okay, there are images, but there are images of one type, and or that have one feature, and features, uh, images that do not have that feature. And then there is a second feature, and then there is a third feature, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So when you think uh, about this, uh, the remarkable thing is that uh, the, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a unique model, statistical model that emerges if you require two sort of very natural things. So first of all, that a priori, you should not impose anything. Uh, you should not impose <laughs> that uh, if a data set is described by a certain feature, then uh, another feature should be present. Okay, so you want what is called, uh, what I think is called disentanglement. That essentially features should be as independent as possible, okay? And the second thing is that uh, you want this distribution to be a distribution of maximal entropy, uh, or maximal relevance, sorry. And, uh, and essentially uh, the Hamiltonian that you get uh, is very simple. It's essentially uh, the maximum index uh, if you have binary variables, uh, so S can be, say, 0 or 1, is the maximal index for which uh, uh, the spin, the, the variable is 1, okay? If you think uh, this describes, if you look at uh, energy, at, at uh, uh, states with a certain energy E, then these are all states where this uh, um, spin is fixed to be 1, uh, all of these spin, all of these uh, features can be present or not, uh, with probability one half. So this is a infinite temperature state, if you want. Uh, whereas all these uh, features should be absent, uh, which means this is like a zero temperature state. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, model. You can study the whole uh, thermodynamics of this. Uh, it's a model that exhibits uh, phase transition between one phase where uh, um, the, the entropy is extensive and one phase between the entropy is of order one, it has very low disentanglement. And, and, and again, I mean, uh, and it has this property that uh, the uh, representations that you learn are, uh, have this continuity property, okay, in the sense that uh, if you train your data set uh, on a given data set 
and then you add more points, huh? then you, you don't screw up what you have already learned. Okay, so uh, at least the, the, the low order features remain the same. Okay? And uh, also if you add another feature, the, um, the representation that you get uh, is essentially as a high overlap uh, with the representation that you had before with one less feature. Okay? And also if you change your parameter G that tunes this uh, um, um, uh, rel this, uh, resolution, then essentially what you see is that you don't change, uh, I mean, the, 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 the representation you get as a high overlap with, with the representation that you had before. Okay, uh, so, um, okay, so let me, let me go to the conclusion because I think uh, I'm over time. Uh, we did some tests uh, and uh, so what I want to stress is that, uh, and this is my last slide, uh, is that essentially um, this is uh, what I tried to describe in this last part uh, is a different type of modality for learning. So, and if you think about it, uh, so uh, the type of learning modality in the city of Bolton machine is one where we know we have very local and generic features. So if you train uh, uh, a city of Bolton machine uh, on one dat data set, uh, then those weights uh, can reasonably well uh, also reproduce uh, another data set. Uh, and this is, uh, this is one example. And uh, so this representation, uh, typically you need over parameterization and stochastic, and, uh, stochastic dynamics to, 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 to train them. And also they have uh, um, um, a limited plasticity. So because when you, uh, when you learn a data set uh, and then uh, you take that model and you train another data set, uh, on another, then then the weights do not change much. And this is essentially why transfer learning works. Transfer learning uses the fact that the internal representation does not uh, change much. As, uh, so what you need to change is only the output layer. Okay, you, you don't need to change the input layer, okay? Whereas, and so, so this tells you that uh, the, the information on, uh, uh, on the data is actually in the internal representation, not much in the weights. The weights are very independent of the, of the, of the data, okay? Whereas when you, when you take a, a model like, uh, the, when you fix the internal representation, of course, uh, all the information in the data sets is in the weights. Is in the, so the weights give you something which is uh, really tells you about the structure of your uh, data set. And um, you have a, so, and because of this, when you change to a new data set, uh, the weights change completely. So you have high plasticity if you want. And, uh, and also, I mean, uh, it can, uh, I argue that it can support higher cognitive function. This is a very bold statement. But essentially, overall, it suggests that uh, these two learning modalities, if you think about uh, a deep architecture, actually, uh, they, in the early stage of processing, you have uh, RBM type of architectures. And the later stage of processing, you have this type of uh, architectures. And essentially what we have tested, these are preliminary results by um, Carlo Orientale Caputo, who is a PhD, uh, master student, just finished his thesis. What we tested, we tested this idea on uh, deep belief networks. Uh, and essentially what we find is that uh, in a deep belief network with 10 layers trained on uh, a simple data set like as, MNIST, et cetera, et cetera, actually the plasticity uh, increases uh, as you go deep. Um, in the sense that if you change from one data set to another data set, the early stages, the, early, the weights of the early layers do not change much. And the deep layers change a lot, the weights. 
And um, what we also found is that uh, early layers are very, sort of very well uh, described by low order models, like pairwise models. And uh, so, um, and this is uh, essentially what uh, people uh, uh, talk about when they think about this hierarchy of abstraction as you go deep. Huh? Because, say, uh, in a pairwise model, you, you, you don't have uh, much abstraction. You have only low order features. I mean, the, the correlation between two variables does not depend on a third variable, essentially. And um, whereas, as you go deeper, uh, you see that pairwise models do not work uh, that well. You start having higher order interaction that becomes important. What is interesting is that we also computed the DKL, actually Carlo uh, computed the DKL between the internal representation and this hierarchical Fisher model. And what he found is that uh, uh, the deeper you go, the more you approach this, uh, this uh, hierarchical Fisher model. This, uh, although you should see that this is point one, so you don't really get to zero. So, I mean, we are not still there, but it gives you an hint uh, that uh, you converge towards uh, a representation which is sort of uh, abstract in the sense that uh, is derived just by first principles. Okay, so this is my conclusion. And, um, and uh, yeah, so uh, try to convince you that uh, this is, a, say, a model-free measure of intrinsic relevance. Uh, so, which I call relevance. And, uh, okay, that this is related to criticality. And that, um, and that it allows you to think about a number of, uh, I think, interesting uh, issues that are related to learning. Okay. Um, thank you. Questions? Yeah, thank you for a really interesting talk. So my question is, it has been observed in biology that particularly in like hippocampus, olfactory cortex, this phenomenon of, of representational drift in which you have like internal representations that change in time, meaning that some like neurons that at the beginning were responsive to a particular stimulus stop being responsive and the whole like coin changes. So assuming that the brain knows what it's doing, uh, that these representations are maximally relevant throughout all the time, do you have an intuition on how the brain could be achieving like continuously changing maximally relevant like representations of a set of fixed uh, stimulus? Uh, no. <laughs> so this, no, I mean, this is why we study this, uh, we try to nail down this uh, questions in simple uh, systems like RBM and DBM. Um, as soon as you go to systems uh, which are more complex, uh, in particular to the brain, I mean, where there are feedwork, I mean, uh, there are connections that go both in one direction and the other, I mean, that's, that becomes very, very complicated, but uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So, uh, your results look very general, right? Yeah. So, the, I want to ask the, uh, the, up to what extent of learning problem the, your results are applicable. For example, uh, you show the some inequality, the number of parameters bounded by the some uh, number of data or something, right? Uh, maybe the, it scales as n over log n. Yes, yes. But uh, for me, the, okay, so the, let's consider the simple perceptron problem in, in statistical mechanics. Okay, we consider the, some uh, subnormal limit that uh, n, the, uh, n scales as alpha times uh, the size, size of m, right? Yes, yes. So how these two are compatible? Yeah, so uh, indeed, so um, say for example, when you think about uh, 
network reconstruction, then we know that uh, there is a, you need only log number of this number of spins, uh, data points, uh, to reconstruct uh, a network, uh, the network of interaction. I mean, this is by pseudo likelihood and things like this. So, I mean, but this is a situation where you know the model. Right. If you know the model, mm -hmm. this is, uh, I mean, is an infinite number of bits in some sense. All oh, right. Okay, so this is uh, essentially an estimate that works when you have no idea what the model is. Oh, right. You mean if that you, uh, uh, if mean we if you do have, not know the prior information about the model architecture, yeah, so yeah. this inequality holds. Yes, yes. So, oh. so I mean, like uh, if you look at uh, biological sequences, or if you look at uh, a recording of neurons in the brain, then of course you have no idea what the model is. And then you want to have an estimate of uh, how rich the model can be. Of course, say, if you say, for example, in network reconstruction, uh, you can estimate uh, an easy model uh, even uh, when all the configurations are different, uh, and then this h of k would be zero, and this would tell you, you cannot do that, okay? okay. But you have decided that you are looking at a pairwise model, which is a lot of information. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I had a question about um, at some point you said something like Gaussian models carry no information or yeah. carry no relevance, sorry, was your, yes, was yeah. your statement. Um, and I was wondering what happens if you have, so you saying if I have, say, Gaussian data and I try to learn it with Gaussian, with a Gaussian model. So let's say the Gaussian data has um, very, uh, so it's very non-isotropic, so some directions of the covariance are much smaller than the others, mm -hmm. but otherwise it's Gaussian data, and I want to learn a Gaussian model with it. Yeah, yes. How does that work out with the, uh, how, do, how does that square with the statement that I have no relevance in, in the? No, no, yes, 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 so in that case, uh, I mean, here, uh, I mean, your weights could be very uh, anisotropic. So you could have some very long directions, and but but the relevance would not depend on the weight. Does not does not depend on the weights, okay? And the idea is that essentially what you are learning, uh, you are not learning about the model. The model you already know, because you start from a Gaussian and you end with a Gaussian. So the 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 the, the structure of the model is fixed throughout. You don't learn anything about that. If you think about, say, when you learn MNIST, uh, you think you learn uh, one model for the ones, one model for the two, one model for the, and, and you learn a mixture of models, okay? And but you could learn a mixture of Gaussian? A, a mixture of Gaussian would not have zero uh, constant relevance. Okay. Because a mixture of Gaussian is not a Gaussian. I see. Okay, I mean, I, I guess the reason I, I stuck on that statement is because I know, because <laughs> we've done it in, in one of our papers, that if you make, if you just want to uh, ma model MNIST with a Gaussian and you make it 728 dimensional, you get very good reconstruction. You get very, you get very good reconstruction. So MNIST is basically a multivariate Gaussian. Yeah, it's a multivariate, ga or, it's a, or, or it's, a, it's a mixture <sighs> of Gaussian. It's very different. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'd have to. I don't remember which one we did. But it, yeah, it could have been a, a mixture. I would yeah. bet it's a mixture of Gaussian. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. No, and you know about this. I think tomorrow morning the first talk by Francesca is going to say that even if you if you uh, scramble the lab labels, uh, then uh, essentially the asymptotic behavior is that of. It's ruled by a central limit theorem. You have this Gaussian equivalence thing, and and and, and but essentially you have scrambled the data, which uh, the, the labels, which means that essentially you you have lost any meaning. Okay, all, all that makes sense has been sort of lost. Uh, I don't know. Francesca is here. No. Okay.
Yeah, this, this reminds me a bit of like independence component analysis where the goal is to make the data the least Gaussian possible. And that's how you find your independent components. But that's just something that came up. Other questions? So just a very quick question. How the inequality where the number of parameters is bounded by uh, the relevance? Th uh, this one. Uh, uh, what is it? This one. How sharp is this? Like, is it always achievable? Uh, is there something special? No, about it's not. It's not sharp. We, we give a few examples uh, in, uh, in the paper. Say, for example, uh, if you take uh, data from this protein data set, uh, then um, essentially this, um, uh, this is a very loose bound in the sense that you get a very large number there. Yeah, so. But I mean, it's the first bound of this type that I, I see. So, and um, yeah. And so my other question is, from a theoretical point of view, Besides this inequality, what's the motivation, like purely from an analytical point of view, what's the main motivation to pick this notion of relevance? Okay, so for example, uh, say, um, okay, so what's the motivation for taking this notion of relevance? Well, uh, it's essentially that you want a notion of relevance uh, that is, um, model free, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's like a notion of, uh, it's like the entropy. The entropy is a measure of information content that is completely independent of what that information is about. Okay, you want a model of how much structure your data has, uh, irrespective of what this structure is. And that's, that's more or less what information theoretic measures give you. Okay, thanks. No, um, uh, Matteo, I had the feeling you need some sort of model, but it's a clustering model, right? I mean, some data point comes in and you have to decide in which box it should uh, um, be put in and then you can calculate the number of uh, um, data points that fall into a certain box. So in some sense you need a clustering model, maybe a mixture model, or something like that, to compute in practice the um, the, the relevance. No, well, you need the data. You just need the yeah, data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have to do something. No, I mean, they, they are continuous random okay, variables. Okay. Okay. They have so, to come yes. up and say, okay, I have to count them into boxes. Yes. And I think okay. that is so in some sense have, clustering, and if clustering you have could be mixture. Data, then, uh, if you have continuous data, then if you have continuous data, then you have to discretize them. And uh, eh? that's a model. model. And that's uh, and that's a model. Yes, yes. So <laughs> I agree. Uh, I agree with you. So that's uh, continuous. Uh, I mean, the, we know continuous variables uh, have a say. say when defining a prior for continuous variable is is complicated. So yeah, that's, we are not solving that problem. Oh, I like yeah. it. It's, it's, it's interesting. Maybe we can thank Matteo again for the great talk. Thank you. Thank you.